The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of Oshkosh Media, the City of Oshkosh, or your video service provider. Hello, this is Edward Kasten for an another edition of Making It Happen. Tonight I have Rebecca and Melissa. And I'm confused on which one is which, so I'll have you, I'll have you introduce yourself. Okay. I'm Rebecca. I'm the Dementia Care Specialist with Winnebago County. Okay. And I'm Melissa Sell. I'm the um, an Information Assistance Specialist with the Aging and Disability Resource Center for Winnebago County. And the first question is to both of you. What did you go to school for? Like, you know, did you go to school for something like this or was it totally different? I went to school for social work, so kind of in the same realm area, kind of looking at something doing this in the future. Uh, I went to, I actually started in nursing for two and a half years at Marion University in Fond du Lac, mm -hmm. and then transferred to UW Oshkosh and finished in with my bachelor's in social work. And nursing is a very tough field. You have to know a lot of stuff, and did you, did you find it tough? I did find it tough, very tough. And even at UWO, it's, it, the, the standards are really, it's like you need to have a 3.7, mm -hmm. so. And what about you? Sure. Um, well, I went to UW Oshkosh as well. Um, I graduated in 2008 um, with a, a degree in social work as well. So that was my um, kind of human service uh, field that I wanted to get into. So. And how did you like your time at UWO? And were the professors really good at what they, what they were, you know? They were. They absolutely were. I really liked the program a lot. I liked my professors. Um, I don't know if you remember, Ed, but we actually were in the same residence hall. Do now, you remember that? Now that I remember the face, yeah. yeah. in Evans <laughs> Hall, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I really liked the campus, uh, um, so it was a good experience. I can say, I could say that people were mostly friendly. That's why I came to UW, was mm -hmm. the, the friendliness of the community. Sure. Um, what did you guys do before working at the ADRC? So I was, uh, when I graduated with my social work degree, I started out in nursing homes. So I was a director of social services in a couple different nursing homes. I started out in the Appleton area, then uh, Plymouth, and then I ended up in Fond du Lac because I'm originally from the Fond du Lac area. So did that for about five years and then this position opened up and got this position. Did you like working in the nursing homes? I did, yeah. It's a lot of work, though. Because nursing homes get a bad rap a lot of times. Yes. Yes, they do. And, um, I, I mean, I enjoyed the work I did. I was very busy, worked a lot of hours, but um, was definitely looking for a change. Mm -hmm. So the ADRC was a good welcome change? Yes. How long did you work at nursing home? Um, I think it was about, well, I actually was a CNA, too, prior to um, getting my social work degree. So I've kind of been in nursing homes since high school, really. So if you so look you, at that, probably like 12 years. Now are you talking about hospital or are you talking about home care? Home care, like nursing home. Okay. Yep. And then, and then you? Sure. Um, I had uh, kind of similar to Becca's story, um, had done some work in nursing homes as a social worker. Um, I started actually, my first job out of college was down in um, Wisconsin Dells at a nursing home down there. Uh -huh. And then I ended up um, taking a position up here in Appleton at a nursing home. And then I ended up working for the family care program. Um, I was a, a case manager with uh, a managed care organization called Community Care. Um, so I worked for them for five years and then I um, saw an opening at the county and um, that was kind of what I wanted to get into. So I've been at the county for four years now. And how do you like it? I, I really like it a lot. Yeah, we have a really great team. Um, we have a great supervisor. Um, so we're really, um, really blessed to have a great, great employer. So let's dive, let's dive into the, um, how do people, when they come into the ADRC, how do they get referred for services or who do they first talk to? Mm -hmm. sure. Kind of, uh, a, it comes from all different areas, really, the referrals can. They can come from nursing home settings, hospital settings, um, 
family members. Uh, Can they come from social workers? Yep, yep. Different organizations out in the community refer to us, and kind of how it's how it works is they call the ADRC. Um, they get our front office uh, team. We have two wonderful ladies that answer the phone, and then they kind of determine on where that phone call goes. So, and if anybody doesn't know the acronym, it's Aging and Disability Resource Center. Correct. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, but. yeah, that's perfect. I mean, we can, yeah, we have those two staff that kind of triage the call and decide wh who it should go to because there's a lot of different people within the Aging and Disability Resource Center. So they kind of field those calls and then get it to the appropriate person. Um, we also have walk-in hours so people can come right into our office and um, talk to someone. What are the walk-in hours off the top of your head? Sure, absolutely. They're uh, <laughs> 8 to 4.30, so kind of normal business hours. Um, we have an Oshkosh location, which is at 220 Washington is in Oshkosh. Okay. That's the Human Service Building um, on the third floor. And okay. then we also have an office in Nina um, on Commercial Street. So, so when they walk in, are they going to see a nurse? Are they going to see a receptionist? Who are they going to? Sure, good question. Um, we have uh, support. We call them support staff. It's basically an administrative person that kind of, again, gathers some information and then um, the goal is for someone to always be able to talk to somebody about their situation. Okay. Um, we like to keep people with the same workers that they've had in the past. So uh, if, if you walked in and you had prior contact with me, we try to keep people with the same workers. But if you have a crisis or an emergency, we yeah. have anybody see you. So um, we're a pretty flexible team. We all work together. What kind of services do you guys offer at the ADRC? Sure. Um, well, that is a kind of a long list of things. Um, so uh, I know it's a gamut question. I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, we have kind of a couple different areas. We have um, 10 information and assistance specialists, which is what I do. And so we spend a lot of time out in the community in people's homes in assisted livings in nursing homes. And we talk to people about what kind of options they might have in their situation. Um, so we might be talking about things like setting up home care or lifelines or... Because um, I know Carla used to work for the ADRC, but mm -hmm. she retired and... Yes, right. she did. So. She did She did retire, yes. She um, it's probably almost a year now that she retired. So, yeah. Um, But yeah, she's worked for the in this position for quite a while. So um, so that's one of, one of the positions is kind of um, exploring resources and options with people and helping them um, kind of guide them because the, this whole system is quite complicated. So... I have a scenario for you. Okay. What happens if somebody moves to Oshkosh? How soon can they get services if they need services? Like, is there mm -hmm. a waiting list or can they? Because, you know, mm -hmm. when you move somewhere, you need care, like, right away. You can't wait around for that stuff. Right. Especially if you don't have any family or friends. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, that's um, there's a lot of possibilities with that question. I guess it depends on what kind of services the person's looking for. Um, if we have people that are in a really critical situation, we always find a way to make, make something happen so that they can remain safe. Um, you know, that might be, you know, if they need 24-hour care, it might be facilitating a nursing home placement or an assisted living placement on an emergency basis. So, yeah. um, or, you know, if, if we can kind of put some temporary support in until we can get them li linked to a, a bigger public program, um, yeah. you know, we can, and I know we're going to talk about those later, but um, so I, I guess it kind of varies on what kind of services, but... Um, you know, we're there to help this, support the person however they need it. On the, on the flip side, what do you do if somebody wants to move out of Oshkosh, but they don't know, gee, I want to move to another state, but I don't know any of the services. Uh, how do you forward mm -hmm. that, them information? Sure. Good. Another good question. Um, so we generally, if somebody I'm working with is interested in moving to Illinois, um, they obviously have different programs and, and regulations and things in the other states, so I would probably help link them to an aging um, you know, in Wisconsin, there is an aging and disability resource center in every county. Um, so there's probably something very similar in, in other states. So I would probably help connect them to the county that they're going to move to. Okay. Um, and then that person would help guide them from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, now let's let's talk a little bit about um, the the different kinds of services. Mm -hmm. You said there's a whole gamut. Like, mm -hmm. but what are, what are the top five that people, you know, the top five or top ten that people really need. Sure, sure. Um, just on a side note, we do have other departments within the or other folks within the Aging and Disability Resource Center. Center. If you wanted me to talk about those now, or should I wait? Um, wait a little bit. You can wait a little bit. Wait a little bit. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, so I don't. I guess I would say like the top services. A big one is um, you know people that um, need more care at home, but they aren't able to afford it. 
so they need um, somebody to come in and help them clean or grocery shop or something like that so like home care um, yeah. also housing is a really big is a really there big a need. real need for home care yeah you know I think that's one of our number one calls I think is people that you know have a, a Either they're an older adult who's who's you know due to medical issues isn't able to do the things they used to do, mm -hmm. or um, somebody with some type of a you know a physical disability or something of that sort. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that yeah, I and think some that's people a big just need. can't afford housing. Well, yeah, because that's expensive too. And I, I heard a number mm -hmm. the other day, I think it was eighteen hundred people are on the waiting list for low income housing in Oshkosh. Is it? Uh, so. I, yeah, I would believe it. I think that's probably another one of our big big callers is uh, is regarding oh, housing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another big one I would say is transportation. You know, people are having um, struggle to get from one place to another, and um, what we got there's a lot of great resources in regards to that. And now let's move on to Re Rebecca a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, with Rebecca, um, as far as the, as far as the, the dementia goes, mm -hmm. um, how do you know if somebody has dementia because it's a scary it's a, it's a scary thing to talk about it's not easy you know they're getting older and maybe they think oh i'm just getting older because i forget you know how do you approach somebody that has dementia because it's it's not an easy topic to talk about especially with family members right so a lot of the time you know the person themselves doesn't always notice that they have dementia so a lot of the times when we get referrals, it's from family members saying that, you know, they've noticed mom or dad have changed, a family member has changed, um, they're forgetful, uh, they're not driving as well, um, kind of just bring up those concerns and mm -hmm. give us a call and kind of ask what the next step is. So sometimes we, uh, the INA specialist and myself can go out to the home and do a memory screen. So it's what do you do for a memory screen? So there's three different kind of tests that you put the can do with the person that has the memory loss. Um, and it's very short and simple. It takes probably about 10 minutes. Um, so the first thing is an animal naming test. Um, you're timed with 60 seconds and you have to list off as many animals as possible. Um, the second one is kind of a recall. If you can recall three words that we give you um, within five minutes. Okay. And then the third is kind of testing your executive functioning and how you follow direction and, and how you can draw a clock uh -huh. and, and write down the time of that clock. So in those three tests, it's not necessarily diagnosing the person with dementia, but it's kind of getting that conversation started. Mm -hmm. And if they don't do well on those three tests, it's referring them to go and see their primary care physician and maybe you know ask those questions when they go and see their physician of hey I'm having these concerns I scored low on this memory test can I have further testing done because there are reversible causes of dementia um, people can have you know vitamin deficiencies they can have so it can be reversed huh? there are some causes that can be you know dehydration infection they can have those things going on so they want to wean those things out at the doctor's appointment and then if all of those factors aren't in play then you know they they do maybe diagnose the person with dementia um without using names because because confidentiality you want to share a quick story about like a couple different stories about the, the whole dementia thing um i really don't have anybody that we've kind of referred out we do do i have done memory screens at the senior center okay. um that I do those every other month and I have people that sign up and I've had cases where people have come because they're concerned. They're having, you know, they're, they don't remember people's names. They've gone to church for many years and they've known people for 20 years and they're starting to forget the, those people's names. Um, so they came in and did memory screens and they didn't score very well. And so having that conversation with them as, okay, you didn't score well, you are having these concerns, you know, maybe going and seeking some medical attention would be in your best interest and, and kind of moving forward with that process. But I haven't, you know, they haven't taken the step of me informing, you know, because that's one of the things that we can do is we can refer and send those tests to the doctor ourselves. We can fax them. Okay. Um, I haven't had that in where I, they've wanted me to do that initial step. They maybe take the test with them and then they say that they're going to contact the doctor themselves. So I don't know where it's gone after that and if they've followed up with anything, but. 
sometimes you have to tell the family because they they might be scared to tell their 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 brother or sister or relative or whatever. Right. You know? We've had calls where we've had to go out to families' homes um, because maybe a police officer has called and give us a, a referral, or somebody out in the community has given us a referral, and family did not know what was going on. Um, in those cases where we feel that they're at risk or that they don't have family that maybe lives close and knows what's going on, we do reach out to the family and say, hey, you know, this is, we've got a, a referral from the police officer saying that this is what they're doing. Um, do you, are you aware of this? And sometimes families aren't aware and didn't know, and sometimes they are, and, and they're okay with it. Um, so we just try to set up the family and that, and that person with as many and sometimes families just like to blow it off, like, oh, they're just getting old. It'll, they'll, you know, they, they try to act like nothing happened, but, you know, right. something is going on. Right. Mm -hmm. So what's mm -hmm. the percentage of dementia? Is it getting worse, better? What's the, I, I know I'm testing you here, but. <laughs> nope, that's okay. So um, kind of where we're at right now is with, after age 65, one in three people are affected by dementia, meaning that, not necessarily a person is getting the diagnosis, but meaning that maybe I get the diagnosis and you um, maybe know somebody who has the diagnosis and maybe she's a caregiver for somebody with the diagnosis. So out of us three, one of us would either know somebody has been diagnosed or um, caregives for somebody with dementia. So that's where the statistics kind of are right now. Um, another statistic is there's and one and do you help in that caregiving aspect? Because somebody with dementia can be, their 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 mood can be one minute they can be happy and go lucky, next minute they can be crying. Or it, it depends, you know, how they're feeling, how they're doing on that day. You help out with like like the caregiving aspect with dementia. Yeah, yeah. So we we meet with the family, the caregiver, and we can give them different resources, different reading materials. Um, we have a class, a powerful tools for caregivers class that we do. Um, I've done one class already this year and kind of the spring and then I'm running another class in fall and that's a six-week course to kind of walk that caregiver through stress and burden and caregiver burnout and how do you manage it and, and different communication tips on how to work with the can, person that you're caregiving for. Can any caregiver go to that or is it just for, de is it just for dementia no. only? Any caregiver can do that. Okay, back to Melissa now. <laughs> um, we had, I had mentioned about, you know, some more programs. Mm -hmm. Like I used to be, I used to be involved with, um, with Lakeland Care, mm -hmm. but now I, I switched to Iris. Okay. And if Iris doesn't work out, I'm probably gonna, 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 gonna go to Community Care. Okay. But so far I love Iris because Good. the independence it gives you, mm -hmm. you can hire and, and fire your own, own workers and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it just, it, it's more independent and, Sure. makes you more responsible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does. It does. Right. So that's one of our one of the major jobs of an information assistance specialist is to um, uh, help teach people about different public programs that are out there. And two of the more most um, uh, well known programs in the area are the Family Care Program and the Iris Program. Mm -hmm. um, so the Family Care Program is a, a Medicaid based program that a social worker and a nurse are assigned to an individual. Um, and they um, and just so people know, before all these programs started, it was just Winnebago County that kind of took the brunt of everything. And I think mm -hmm. family uh, Lakeland started around 2010. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So, so there's kind of a, a transition in the state from like the community options program or the COP waiver program, yeah. and a transfer then to family care and IRS. Um, and so underneath family care, there's two organizations that operate that program, and those are called Lakeland and Community Care. So if someone chooses the family care program, then they can choose between Lakeland and community care. And like you had said, it's kind of, you can switch around if you're not happy with Lakeland for whatever reason, you can switch to community care and vice versa. Um, so there's lots of choices. So, um, so the, again, with the family care program, the nurse and social worker are assigned. They come out and meet with the individual and discuss what their needs are, and then they, they help to meet those needs. Um, the other program is called IRIS, um, and that stands for Include, Respect, I Self-Direct. Mm -hmm. And like you had mentioned, Ed, it's very self-driven. Um, so I've only been with him for a month, but I've been, I've been, I really like it. Okay, so. awesome, so. awesome. So um, the the IRIS program, what we do in order to assess eligibility for these programs, we number one, the person has to have medical assistance, so they have to have a form of Medicaid. 
Um, so we at the Aging and Disability Resource Center can help them to uh, screen them for that program, uh, for that, uh, that financial program. Um, we also do something called a functional screen, which is uh, an assessment of what the person's able to do and what kinds of things they need help with. So um, those are the two kind of eligibility keys. Um, and the Aging and Disability Resource Center is the only agency that does that functional screen. So um, once somebody is, is eligible for that, we will talk about what program choice they're most interested in. So And that's what Carla would come on do. I mean Correct. Carla Carla would be the, your first contact and then mm -hmm. and then uh and then uh, and somebody would come on to your functional screen. Uh, yep, like Carla would have been the one that would have done the screen. So we're the ones that do the actual screening, but okay. then we sit down with the person and discuss. These are kind of your program options, and then the person can choose what fits best for them. Okay. Um, and so with the IRIS program, based on that functional screen that we do, it, it creates a budget of money. And then, like you had said, you can kind of hire your workers, fire your workers. You're kind of the one in charge. Um, so you have to come up with a backup plan. If you know if this worker quits, this is what I'm going to do. So it gives you a lot of, a lot of um, independence, and then you have a consultant that that helps guide you if you have questions, right? Yep. Yep. So there's four different consulting agencies in our county. Um, so those. Are um, through the community, what what do people like? Do they like Lakeland better? Do they like community care? You know, because mm -hmm. they might have their favorite. They might have their you know. Sure. Sure. Yeah, you know, I think it's probably pretty even. Um, you know, there's some people that really like the idea of IRIS because they like the idea of being independent and kind of managing their own plan. And then we have other folks that like family care better because maybe they're like, I kind of want a case manager to kind of guide me a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I think it varies on the person. Um, we have some people that switch programs. So like you had said, you started with family care and then you switched to IRIS. Yeah. Um, so people can switch back and forth. Um, we have to be non-biased, so we don't ever tell someone, well, we think this would be a better fit for you. You know, we just give them the information and we try to guide them the best we can without, you know, steering them in one direction. The one hiccup I just wanted to clear up was when you switch to Iris, mm -hmm. some people, the, the like the wheelchair companies that you that you get a hold of or whatever, they think you switch insurances. The only difference is Lakeland doesn't manage your, 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 your Medicare anymore, your Medicaid. You manage it. It's kind of, it's directly. So. Correct. Yeah. There's a lot of, the, kind of a lot of pieces to things. And so... Um, it's a misconception that that people have. Yep, so. yep, yeah, yeah. And so the, it's great that we have choices, right? But they are also very overwhelming. Um, so some counties actually, you know, for family care, we have two program, two options: Lakeland and community care. Some counties have like five or six. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how like overwhelmed people can get. Yeah. Um, but we try to do our best to guide people. But we, you know, we're not, you know, we don't run those programs ourselves. We just try to guide them. So we'll help connect them with their program so, a social worker. I guess one thing I didn't like about 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 the whole Lakeland is I just I felt it was time to get on my own and mm -hmm. with w when you're with a family care you have to with with Lakeland you have to pick an agency and every agency always comes in there and talks a good selling point but when it comes time to come in they can be five ten fifteen minutes late and they're like I don't have to stay extra long I can just yeah. You know, I can just, you know, and right. a lot of times I'd be dripped out of a half an hour or 25 minutes. I've even, I've even had caregivers, not with, not with Iris, but I've even had caregivers eat food on me. Oh. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's, you know, it's kind of a health, a, a home care crisis. You know, it's, it's finding the right workers. There's not always a lot of great, you know, workers, but there are some really fabulous workers too yes. that, that do a great job. Yes. So uh, it's kind of with every industry, you know, there's always a couple bad apples in the group. And, and this is not just a Lakeland thing. It's kind of every agency's got, got stuff. So, um, yeah. you know, but if you have, people ever have issues with their caregivers, I always direct them back to their social worker um, to, to kind of guide them. What if you don't feel like your social worker is doing the appropriate job? Can you go above and beyond? Can you go to their supervisor and mm -hmm. and how far can you go up to the chain before you get something done? Sure, you go as far as you, <laughs> far as you have to go is what I would say. You know, right. for some of those folks, they might decide, okay, this the social worker that I have or the consultant that I have with Iris is just not working out, or we don't have. Our personalities might be a little different or something like that. You can request a change of a consultant or of a of a social worker. And then, you know, hopefully the, the organization would respect that and switch you to a different team. Or maybe it's you go up the ladder to the supervisor or the supervisor's supervisor. Uh, or it might just be a, a change between, you know, Lakeland versus community care, IRIS versus family care. So there might just be switches that yeah. you'll have to do that way. 
Um, so, but in because you, you're, you're always not going to get along with everyone, right? right. Yeah, so. yeah, and these people aren't in your homes every minute, you know, they're, they're there to consult and they see you several times a year, but um, so it's kind of your job too to make calls to them and say, Hey, this isn't working out. So, so do you want to talk about some of the other programs? Yeah, I would love that. Um, so we can talk about. We have kind of two other major areas in our ADRC. We have uh, adult protection workers, and adult protection workers are um, social workers or human, human service professionals who are kind of working with the most vulnerable people in the county. Um, so, so do they work with like caregiver abuse, that kind of thing? Correct, right. yep, 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 exactly. They may work with people who um, maybe have, in Becca's case, like maybe have advanced dementia. Now, or, what, what constitutes caregiver abuse? Like somebody eating your food, is that kind of abuse? Or is that not, because they're eating something you bought and they're taking right. it away from you. Yeah. So what what's considered abuse? Well, you know, I think that it's important for anyone to call if they have any concerns, and then the adult protection worker can kind of investigate if it, it warrants moving forward. Okay. Um, you know, if it's something like, you know, it was a one-time little thing, it might, might not warrant a big investigation, but if it's, you know, this person has been stealing food from this person, or this person has, you know, all of a sudden they're missing $20 bills, or they've made a big transfer out of someone's account, you know, there's financial exploitation, there's also, you know, obviously physical abuse and yeah. neglect. So there's a lot of different areas. So I, I would just encourage... Does, does verbal count in that too? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely, absolutely. Because so. I've, I've been verbally a lot. Okay, so, okay. Just wondered. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. I would just encourage you or anyone to call our, our main office um, and discuss, um, ask to talk to an adult protection worker and they can kind of guide you from there. Um, so they also help people with things like guardianships and protective placements. So um, one of the big areas that we help people a lot with is creating their powers of attorney. Okay. So um, which is something I still have to get in place because you do. If something could have, if something happens to me, then the state takes over, right? Well, if since I'm my own guardian right now. Sure, sure. So in the state of Wisconsin, we are not a next of kin state. So just because you're Say your mom is your mom and your brother is your brother doesn't automatically default to them if something happens to you. There has to be um, either a power of attorney done ahead of time or it results in a guardianship. So um, if something were to happen to me, if I were to get ill, mm -hmm. not saying that's going to happen, but mm -hmm. then if I can't make decisions for myself, then is it up to the state what happens to me? Well, the the, the uh, I, a judge would appoint someone to make decisions for you. So okay. if you have a family member, they may appoint a family member, or otherwise there's something called a corporate guardian who is basically a company um, that's, that, that provides guardianship for, for lots of people that need it. So, um, so powers of attorney are extremely important because if you have your power of attorney done um, and it's done appropriately, then it doesn't, um, hopefully will never result in a guardianship because um, a power of attorney will um, appoint someone to make decisions for you. Yeah. So those are things that we do for free at the Aging and Disability Resource Center. We don't charge people for those. People also can go to attorneys for them as well. Okay. Um, another big area that we have in our, our agency are benefit specialists. Mm -hmm. So we have disability and elderly benefit specialists who are um, four great ladies that provide assistance with people for questions like how do I apply for disability? Um, how do I, I'm confused about what it means when I have Medicaid. I don't know what this means about what is Medicare Part A and there's all types of those kinds of questions. We have ladies that can provide um, answers for those things and at no charge. Okay. So that's another great part of, of what we do. Do you guys offer a class on falls too or how to prevent falls? Because a lot, a, a lot of it happens with, um, kind of like me, with the, the disabled and elderly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Fall, we, pre fall prevention. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, I'm part of the Wellness Plus Committee, um, and they are doing kind of it's public health people are involved, um, different community members are involved in that committee, and what they do are they're promoting these evidence based classes. Okay. And kind of what evidence based means is there's been studies done that these classes have. Um, made improvements on people's lives to prevent falls. Okay. So um, there's multiple different classes that people can join throughout the community, throughout Winnebago County, that um, build strength in their legs and their arms so that they can, you know, get easier within, out, in and out of a chair. Within, and Within our last 20 seconds here, what would you tell the, the people from the community if they have a question? 
Sure. Um, just that if they have any questions about dementia or any of the topics that Melissa kind of covered that, you know, to definitely give the ADRC a call. We have a Facebook page. Um, we have an ADRC Facebook page, a dementia page, and then we also have a website. Thank you. This is Edward Cash. We're making it happen.